right, hello everyone. I think we are good to go everyone. It's Saturday night, it is time for us to talk about anime. How you guys been? Good so far, getting ready for uh, a, a trip later next week, so mm -hmm. I'm going to be very happy about that. Yep. Cool, cool. Yes, I woke up this morning, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> there. <laughs> So that's always a plus. Yes, mm -hmm. always exactly. a plus side. Um, well, we are here today to talk about a remarkable anime film, the Royal Space Force: The Wings of Honiyamise, and this film came out according to um, one of the folks at Gainax. The basically they had been working. Um, uh, Gainax had been working organizing conventions and. Um, uh, just sort of, um, they started General Products, which is sort of their anime store, and so they had a bunch of contacts in the industry, and apparently there was some money left over from a project um, that hadn't really gone forward, and uh, one of the financiers behind this thing said, hey, you know, we finance anime, would you want to make an anime at some point? And they're like, yeah. Um... <laughs> And so they what? said, "Of course not. No, yeah, no. Yeah, we're, into, yeah. we're into making toys and and children's shoes, <laughs> pretty much." Um, and that's kind of the weird thing is that they had, you know, they, they had been um, uh, really much fans, and then they gotten into more the product side of things, and then they got into the anime side of things. And uh, and by the way, General Products, you know, that is a play on a Larry Niven thing, a science fiction thing. So it, it was an anime right. store, it was a sci-fi store. But anyway. Um, and so they got into to making anime. And so Royal Space Force was, whoops, what just happened? There we go. Royal Space Force was very much their, their statement to the anime industry in a lot of ways. Um, they thought this was their one chance to make an anime. Or they figured they would never get back into this again. This was kind of their, their one thing. Because they weren't anime producers, right? Wow. They were just this, you know, a bunch of geeks, basically. Um, so they kind of, you know, <laughs> shot their load with this. Talent. You know. Yeah. Um, and so they got together, you know, Hideaki Yano and all sorts of folks to work on this, on this project and really kind of um, make something that was a big statement for them. Uh, and it, I think it's one of the reasons why it is, in many ways, a very artsy film. Um, you know, it feels more like an art house film than a lot of other things you've made. It, it's not like... You know, the character designs aren't very anime in the classic sense. Um, you know, they, they yeah. look like anime characters, but there, there's, there's kind of a three-dimensionality to them. And um, it's just a very un unusual film. So it came out as a sort of shot across the bow to say, hey, folks, do this. Um, which, again, is one of the reasons I think it starts very quiet with just these shots of, um, um, of you know... Of basically this guy trudging through the snow going to look at technology um, which I think yeah. is in and of itself kind of a, uh, a statement because this is um, it's always interesting to see how folks start something because this is this is what geeks love right um, is going and looking at uh, you know <laughs> ships yeah. and, and fighter jets <laughs> and all this kind of stuff and this guy's like, this is what I want to do. And you get this very grounded, realistic <clears throat> animation of these ships. And what they do so brilliantly is you look at them like, oh, okay, it's like an aircraft. But it's, that's not an aircraft carrier. And that looks kind of like, a, that's, that's not anything I recognize. Man. And everything's just a little bit off. Um, and they give you all of these, um, these hints that we're, you know, we're, Earth, this is not. Right. Um, well, the interesting thing about that o opening bit mm -hmm. is the actual plane that is mm -hmm. taking off mm -hmm. looks like a World War II experimental Japanese fighter called mm -hmm. a Shinden. Okay. Cool. I mean, it's almost exactly the same design, uh, except for the weird, like, double rotor mm -hmm. propeller on the back. back. Yeah. Um, but it's almost exactly a drop dead match. Uh, yeah. Which I was just kind of like, okay, are you. <laughs> are you this is are you are you trying to like link people in so that you're not like totally out in the sea like what's going on here and you could be like okay i sort of recognize that yep. so now we're aircraft i gotcha okay mm -hmm. i see where we're going military thing like yep. okay maybe mm -hmm. exactly um 
uh, including this very Macross style, you know, yeah. opening of the, the ship and so forth. Um, uh, and then you go into concept art. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, which was really, really you cool, know actually yeah, yeah it was it totally. was like looking back at World War One photos yeah where it's just all these kind of things where it's like wow the the sort of way that they made it grainy in the actual mm -hmm. rendition of the picture gave it that sense of like some age on it and yeah. like a pre color kind of world I'm like oh my mm -hmm. gosh this is really cool yeah no totally um, and it's I, it it feels like one of those things where what do you do in your opening credit sequence for a movie like this? Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tough thing to figure out. I think it's, it's a wise thing of saying, let's not reveal our cards too much, but give the audience something to look at that's visually distinctive, but makes them th wonder still, what's, what exactly is going on here? Um, um, and so we get a sort of Apocalypse Now opening with our main character. Which, which you're, talking about, you're talking about Gynax. Mm -hmm. And I'm not spoiling anything by saying jumping through to the very end credit, mm -hmm. but it's, you know it's got Gynax on it. Mm -hmm. And as it scrolls through, did you notice the part where it said Dicon Film? Yes. yes. Oh yeah. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> right there. <laughs> like, oh. Well, because what they did so so for the Dicon animations, they basically brought together a whole bunch of folks to animate that stuff, and then when they came to make Honey Misa, they're like, let's call all those folks up again. And yeah, bring them together. It's like, basically that's the same so group. amazing, you know. I'm like, dude, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I saw that credit, I was just like, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So when when this is my first time seeing the the, mm -hmm. the movie, um, and I'm just gonna have to say that, um, and we'll get to the scene later on, but mm -hmm. with the exception of the one scene, uh, this is it was really um, amazing to me, and I'm gonna have to rejigger my top ten anime. Not exactly sure. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. it, but yep. it's, uh, it's 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 up there now. Mm -hmm. And the first <clears throat> when you're talking about the first thing, him trudging out in the snow, and then having the 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 voice exposition of talking about himself. And one of the things I liked about that exposition was that even though it took about two minutes as he's trudging out, mm -hmm. and we're seeing the different planes, and we're seeing the montage, and his voice in the background, once the the film started to get going you realize i don't need to know anything more about this character yeah. because here he is mm -hmm. and he, you get the great explanation of him which is i really love these jets i wanted to fly one of these jets but you know life kind of went this way and mm -hmm. not the sharpest tool in the shed and <laughs> now i'm now I'm, I'm back dry and you know i have after having aimed for the start now i'm back down in in the middle and he talks yeah. about class and, mm -hmm. and back in the middle yeah. of class and then it goes starts talking about space force mm -hmm. and you know for for those out in chat land who you know just to let you know space force actually had a cool connotation to it prior mm. and now mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it doesn't have that comedic connotation yeah. so it was kind of interesting to see that and now here's where i'm at and they just so show this burgeoning space program and it's just kind of like yeah. and, and he's looking at it as well as his compatriots are like going you know just kind of like <laughs> oh yeah we're here we're here so we don't have to be and honestly they're there so they don't have to be there when that war starts mm -hmm. yeah yeah yep well it's well and this is the thing that's weird that mm -hmm. i don't i don't know and maybe maybe you guys do know and have seen found out it's like it's flipped the idea that usually and like the u.s space program mm. when they were trying to get up to the point of getting alan shepard on top of a rocket mm. to send him into orbit you had people who were in the air force that were desperately trying to get mm. qualified to be yeah. the first on that rocket mm -hmm. so yeah. it was oh the air force is meh you know we we fly we we, we sorty things it's air force here's this exciting new thing mm -hmm. and in this film it's the complete mm -hmm. flip <laughs> where yep. it's, why is it the air force is like holy cow that's awesome <laughs> uh rockets space yeah, yeah who cares yeah. i also wonder if there aren't um parallels to um japan in world war ii where you know if you were um in the military kind of front lines doing stuff that was one thing 
But if you were in some weird experimental project, no one was paying attention. So you were safe. Mm. So there were a lot of people who mm. were in these, you know, oddball situations or the, the oddball units doing things that were kind of off the yeah. thing. But you're not on the front lines. You're not, ex- not exciting. It's not the big, the big new thing. But I think you're absolutely right that you know, this, is, this is deliberately setting up an, a, a flip to the real life space race is saying this is some bizarre yeah. project that no one believes is ever going to go anywhere. Um, and is just, you know. Well, which makes me wonder why. Thing. Well, not why. But if they use the Shinden as an example, uh, because mm-hmm. that was a pro- prototype, like far reaching kind of futuristic aircraft even though it wasn't jet powered Mm -hmm. it still had high performance it it was still fly by wire so you're not you're not you know you're you're relying on your stick and rudder technique you're not relying on the computer to do it Mm -hmm. and it was hard by its design to control Mm -hmm. so those people in that program you know what i mean they were locked down to try and get that prototype going and Mm -hmm. yes they were kind of isolated from everything else going on they weren't, you know, cranking out zeros or right. Kates or any of the other aircraft. So, you know, what I mean, it's like there's so much I wonder about what mm-hmm. goes on in the background that's not said. And you know I, mean? I, I, um, and this is being ahead. made for otaku who would know all that stuff, right? Like, the, right. That's their audience, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. So, so as I'm watching this, I'm I'm kind of like thinking to myself, going, okay. Um, so I didn't know the type of plane, but it looked like a real plane to me, mm-hmm. by the way, John. It, it, it was one of those things where I looked at it, and I was just like, it, actually, what it reminded me of was the, the British, the, one of the first British um, mono wings, which had the propeller in the back. Mm-hmm. And that was that was definitely a, a test, test plane. So that looked real to me. Um, but So I was kind of wondering if that was a thing or not. So now I know. Thank you. Um, but... Uh, the 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 thing about what you guys are bringing up about how like intense the pilots are it's it's mm. because the, the i think in the movie what it is is that there's no idea nobody cares about space what is up because mm. they talk about space. Right. what what is up there what why do we mm. want to go there why what's the whole what's the whole point and when the girl explains to him why it's so exciting to her mm. he buys into that excitement and he figures out oh wait you know there is a purpose to go there mm-hmm. whereas here on the earth or the whatever proto earth whatever you want to call it yeah. um yeah. you know they're playing so yeah earth two. yeah right earth two Enter <laughs> the dc universe um anyway um but they're making such an effort on these experimental planes because that's the real thing there mm-hmm. is a burgeoning war coming on this is yeah something that's happening the world is at flux because when you think about um the space race the real space Mm -hmm. race between russia and or soviet union and the united states in the 50s and 60s that was a real thing that was like Mm -hmm. that was the other thing is that there was like you know a lot of country behind it it was a lot of national prestige and and desire to to be first whatever and but there was a lot of it wasn't the world wasn't as small then there was Mm. you know conflicts going everywhere so the 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 practicality of a space program in that world wasn't good because it wasn't you you know nobody really thought about it simply because no one everyone was just like well once we get up there literally somebody i think somebody asked this in in the anime well once we get up there what 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 do we do with it Mm -hmm. you know why 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 are we doing this why you know why that question yeah, I get a, I get a big again. sense that they don't have an atomic program. Right. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Even yeah. though you've got jets and prop planes and other things, it's like you have – and I, I think I'm, I'm kind of glad in a way from a you know humanistic side of it that mm. you don't have someone say, you know what? The space race is awesome because then we can build orbital platforms to drop weapons mm. down from orbit. Mm-hmm. And it's like nobody brooks that question. Right, true. It's about well, what's the utility of going to space? It's like, you know, that's wow. What a purist yeah. humanist thought. And what does the what's the advantage versus the war advantage? It's and, like, hmm. and again, I think this is this is why you get an anime from otaku tackling those things because these are otaku who think we should go to space. Period. We should become an interplanetary species, right? Like yeah. we all love Elon Musk, right? This is the audience <laughs> of this. 
Yeah. Um, and and again, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, is that they're approaching it from that perspective of saying, let's not make a film where it's about, you know, military versus pacifists. Let's just pose this right. question, pose the situation and say, okay, you know, why, as you say? Um, and Man, mankind's in, innate and inherent urge to push on yep. to the absolute nth degree mm -hmm. to things that it, that excite our curiosity. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about excitement later. The thing ah. about this movie, though, is that um, and one of the things I love about the movie is that you know you start with again this very sort of um, uh, the, these these jets and these or these, these these aircraft and then this very Japanese cemetery um, in, in in layout yeah. style, but yeah. then these. A ridiculous big, a big uniforms, cemetery. <laughs> right? Yeah, but then these ridiculous uniforms that look like nothing you know you've ever seen anywhere else, and you're like, okay, that's weird. Um, and then they go back to um, uh, you know training, and you see all their equipment, and you see um, yeah. uh, him eating his his food, and then you see him go out for R and R, and every detail of this society has been thought through and nothing is exactly equivalent to any one real world culture yeah. down to the coinage yeah. the fact that they use like metal rods as coinage it's just all these little things that are just brilliant um and it does yeah, what I think I was... a lot of good science fiction does is it, it it takes you out of your real world context you can you can look at it from a fresh eye that's what I was gonna say when the the when they first came on and they're doing the funeral scene and the woman's with the rocks and she's it it reminded me of um this Buddhist temple I, I used to go to where the guy would, would sit there and he would say Omaha 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 over and over again, you know, blessings to God. And you know, and you know, it, you know he'd sit there and go Omaha 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 Omaha. And it just reminded me of that, and I was just like, I was just like, I was like, holy crap! And then you see the cost, well, you know, the uniforms, mm -hmm. the costumes, maybe their uniforms, and I'm like, that looks like Incas. Yeah, yeah. You it's know? definitely a very like a South American Inca. look. Yeah. yeah, you know. And then the way that the gravestones are, and you get some sense of never explained importance as to the circular rock on top of the stone yeah. that is not actually fixed yeah. to the stone because mm -hmm. the dude just knocks it over. It's just like, uh, oh. No, can't do that. <laughs> well, I'm th I'm thinking now that somebody who whoever's out there in chat land or you guys correct mm -hmm. me. I think it's supposed to be somewhat representational of Jizu, the little Jizu statues, uh, where he's got he's the uh, little Buddhist monk and he's got the little bald head right, and he's sure. got his robes and oftentimes you know you see they put like a red scarf on him and other things. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. that's supposed to be what mm -hmm. the little rock on the top is it's supposed gotcha. to represent jesus uh, uh, so yeah. a little buddhist okay. monk figure mm -hmm. makes sense cool um and yeah there's just all sorts of little things like that little detail like that yeah. all throughout the movie of just just interesting little oddities and then like you have the inside of the um the the, the girl's house which is very kind of 60s Norwegian? I don't know. Um, it's, just, um, it's just very distinctive. Ikea. I yeah, and, you know. Um, and it's going to be the Beatles lovely, song Norwegian Wood playing in the background. Um, all these lovely, you know, swooping things out of wood and, and, and such. Yeah. And, but again, not, very, not Japanese, but not like European, not anything. Um, and it just really feels like they, they tried to make this very specific to its world. Um, so you have the girl, and actually I want to uh, backtrack uh, here a little bit because one of the things they do establish early on before he even gets there, when they're out on, on the town, is that these are basically Air Force jockeys, and so they have a reputation. Right? They have yeah. girlfriends, right. they have p girls who are not their girlfriends, they're going out, they're doing this, and our protagonist is not really into that as much, but he's one of the guys. Um... And then he stumbles on this uh, um, this missionary, basically, um, who's out proselytizing on the street. And it should be pointed out, there's something that we don't see as much over here in America. This is not uncommon in Japan and Asia and other countries. We're just standing on the street, proselytizing, just doing their thing. Um, right. And obviously Japan has a long tradition of 
I use the word cults in the more dictionary sense of just, you know, small religious practices that have 10 members or 20 members um, right. or 100 or 1,000. And so this is, this is a thing you would see, and people do just kind of walk by and ignore it. Um, but like he just key, the metal, key the Metal Idol exactly. uh, with their cult thing mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, then he gets intrigued. Um, and, uh, and he got to meet her. Um, and what I find so interesting about this is how much it's unlike so many other anime scenes like this, where nothing really happens. He's just spending yeah. time with this person. He doesn't really have an agenda. She has an agenda, but we all know where it's going. She's just kind of trying to, to bring him to her, his side. But she's like not really pursuing right. this much. Um, and it's just this kind of lovely scene of, of a bunch of characters all interacting and just kind of sussing each other out. Um, which, again, for a movie, is kind of unusual to not have that big drive towards, towards the next plot point. Yeah, to not have the, the clarified character track mm -hmm. that then you can just yeah. move, the, move the action along. But I think it was very interesting for him as a character yeah. that he's stuck in the middle. He's stuck in this, you know, sort of malaise that is the 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 space program. He is very much portrayed as a guy, mm -hmm. but there is a, a sort of naivete about him mm -hmm. where he's walking through the red light district and he waves. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, that he's he's in it, he's around it, he's surrounded by it, he'll drink, he'll play cards. But he's got this almost fresh-faced youth kind of thing going on where he, he kind of – and that's where sitting down with Mana and with Rikini is it, – it's, it's such an interesting juxtaposition of his manhood mm -hmm. and his humanity. He wants to know them on a human level, yeah. but he's attracted Rikini, and he's not entirely sure how to approach that. Yeah. And he's – he is internally conflicted and awkward, and they've animated that well, even in just the quiet moments where he just he stop he doesn't know what to say next. Mm -hmm. So it gives you that palpable sense of like he doesn't know how to how to land this. Yeah. Does he want to know what she's talking about, mm -hmm. or does he want to be sort of more of the guyish in the red light district, be like, "Hey, how you doing, girl? Let's go." You know what I mean? <laughs> He's trapped in the in between of that. So for me, when he was, um, you know, going back towards the beginning, when he's sitting in in whatever that bar area, just kind of mm -hmm. wool gathering and just kind of thinking about things, and yeah. you realize that it's the funeral of one of his compatriots, yeah. and he's not as upset as you would think he should mm -hmm. be, and he's kind of caught in this fatalism of what this program is, and he's sort of caught up, like, in the one thing he had in his life was that he wanted to fly jets. Yeah. But he can't have that. So he's in this thing. And he's just kind of just, he's literally just, to me, he's just coasting through life at this yeah. point. So like you're saying, you know, yeah, okay, the guys are playing cards. I'm going to play cards. Oh, the guys are drinking. I'm going to drink. All right, you know, this is going to happen. That's happening. So I'm going to do that. And so then when as he's walking through, as, as he's abandoned, basically, by his friend, mm -hmm. and he goes off to get some cookie, he's wandering through waving the people because he doesn't, like you say, he doesn't know how to land it. He doesn't know yeah. what he's going to do next. He's aimless. He's got nothing. Mm -hmm. He's literally got nothing. He's just like, I'm very I'm middle. Here. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Very, very, middle. very middle. It's like, so then he comes across mana and, you know, like mana, the gods, mana, food, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's, you know, he, he comes across her and, you know, she says something very provocative, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, her, her religious mantra that she's throwing out there to everyone. And he somehow takes the thing and then he goes off and it's stuck to his face and it's imprinted <laughs> in his face. And it's a great little scene where his friend like reads off his jeek, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, huh? but, but what? of, yeah. of the one thing that he remembers though, of the night is what she was talking about. Yeah. And it interested him. So he, out he goes, he goes, okay, where's the address? Okay. I'm going to go out there. Mm -hmm. And as he goes out there and he sits down and he talks to her, and she starts saying things, and then she finds out that he is in the space program, and suddenly she lights up, and you know his reaction is like, "Oh wait, you mean you dig this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, what, the hell is wrong? It's almost like he almost wanted him to say, going, the hell is wrong with you, girl?' Yeah. This, this is, <laughs> you know. But um, but as she's talking about it, and she's she kind of throws her 
view out there how it's like not war how it's this and how you know maybe that's a way to bring peace and you know some type of mission with it Mm -hmm. and then you see him get excited and you see him do a 180 when he comes back yeah Mm -hmm. so it's like it's almost as if he's through for what she's saying found this purpose but at the same time there's that little part that we come to see later that kind of like yeah kind of like how can i work this (laughs) <laughs> how do I do this? How do I? How do I? And I didn't know there was going to be a kid, so you know, right? I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, complicates things definitely. Um, yeah. Well, it, and it's it's really fascinating because you get this whole, um, you know, because of the fact that he is legitimately intrigued by her, you know, by what she what she believes by her perspectives on life. Um, it's kind of the whole package. It's not just, oh, she's cute. Like, there's a whole thing that he's interested in, um, which is, again, not your typical Hollywood leading man kind of a, of a, of a uh, interaction in, uh, immediately. Um, um, and, but then you also get the, the woven in thing that there are radicals trying to sabotage the Royal Space Force. Yeah. And, you know, who's involved in that? Who knows what's what's going on, um, um, and then as the movie progresses, we just start seeing more and more of him becoming kind of oddly the guy that we always would want to be in this situation. You know, kind of the the gung ho. Let's do this. I'm up for all the training. I'm up for all the things. Um, yeah. Um, and he's the only one kind of who cares in a real way. Um, despite, and I think it's interesting that the training training montages they mm-hmm. used. If you look back mm. at some of the early NASA, oh yeah, like, film of mm. training, it's yeah. like you had actually people doing these Going ridiculous, these like oh, the, yeah. you know the big the big centrifugal kind of mm-hmm. kind of machine. There's films from like the late oh, sure. 50s before they built the giant center view where they're literally mm-hmm. spinning them around, running around. Yep. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God. Mm-hmm. I'm like, good on you. It, it, reminded, it, it reminded me of that one clip from um, was it The Right Stuff where they show the guy where they're this sudden acceleration up into the air, then slowly bring him back mm-hmm. down. Yeah. And then you can clearly, everyone's just like, how you doing? And the guy's just like, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, and there, there's a whole side story about that in the space race too. By the way, where, where they, you know, they realized they wanted to push people as hard as they could, but they also realized they were working with like Chuck Yeager style guys who didn't want to be yeah. seen as weak, so they couldn't always yeah. trust what the people would report to them. Yeah. Have to deal with all that kind of stuff too, of of you know bravado and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a whole well. Thing. How about the NASA NASA program with the rocket sled, where the guy decelerated oh, at like an obscene amount of G's, and yeah. it like burst all the blood vessels in his eyes, mm. and it, like did terrible things to him. Mm-hmm. But he was just like, do it. Let's do it. I want to go, you know, twelve hundred miles an hour on an open sled, and then stop mm-hmm. me in like less than five hundred feet. Yeah. Like, oh mm-hmm. God. Yep. Uh, but yeah. data. Oh, the data. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. You need kind of person. Um, yeah. Um, um. And then again, what I find is so interesting is that this this movie doesn't stop there. It then starts interlaying elements of um of culture of religion of of history of yeah. what all this means for them as a society um for the fact that there is kind of a space race going on there's not a space race but a um um a military race going on that they have to you know be seen as powerful and so forth um and it's just it, it's you know it's complicated <laughs> there's there are many forces at work in any of these sorts of things and i think it, it it ties back to your audience that they're saying you know, obviously, the audience is kind of that otaku market, um, but it's speaking to all the things that um, that otaku care about in a very adult way. You know, it's not just rockets are cool; it's 
there are politics and there there's money. Yeah. You know, they, they talk about how obscenely expensive this program is. Um, and then you see, you know, shots in the street of people starving, and it's like, mmm, mmm, you know. Yeah. I think that that's that's very true. Um, all right, so we've beaten around the bush. Let's, let's get let's get to the scene, um, which I cannot show you. Um, but basically, there's a there's a a scene in this movie where um, our our hero um, uh, Shirotsu comes to to see Bikini again. She's changing. Uh, changing clothes, and so he gets up, goes over to her as she's changing, um, grabs her, um, she falls down, he falls on top of her, he tries to stop her. I rewatched this scene, okay, and, and uh, she's struggling, she grabs like a basically a trophy, hits him on the head, knocks him out, Yeah. fade to black, that's it. It's never referenced again, there's no... Nope. You know, there's no apology, there's no nothing. And it really comes out of nowhere in, in its own way. But I actually rewatched this scene today because um, I, I noticed something about it. Namely, that when, when she's changing, he gets up and he starts striding across the room. Yeah. And you know what's happening. Like, you know where this is going. And then, you know, she's surprised. It happens very quickly. He grabs her. He goes in. And at least on my rewatching, it looked like he was going in to kind of embrace her. And to sort of grab her. She reacts. They fall down. And they start struggling. And he's clearly kind of trying to stop her struggling and hold her down. And then she looks at him and he stops. And then she hits him on the head and knocks him out. And I realized, obviously, this there is a sexual assault aspect to this. There's just no question there. Mm-hmm. But the way they they phrased it wasn't as as violent as when I first saw it. It came across to me like he clearly had a goal there. He was clearly trying to, 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 to go for something there. Um, but he wasn't coming at it with the... Um, malice. Malice. Thank you. Yeah. And there was a certain amount of, you know, I'm going to be the man. I'm going to take charge. And I'm going to, you know, do the thing that I've seen all these guys doing it. And it goes horribly wrong. Yeah. Um, and I found it was very interesting to do that in... And, and in a way that, again, in a lot of anime and a lot of, of pop culture, either this just works, let's be honest, the girl just gives in, um, or it's kind of danced around. And what I found is, well, what I found interesting is how in this, you know, they drive us to it and they kind of build up this dread. And when he tries it, it ends very poorly for him. Um, I still think it feels completely out of place. I think the intent is to see, is to say, you know, he's been going out with his girl. There's been no sort of physical, you know, evolution of that. He's frustrated. He's like, okay, I'm going to make my move. And he (laughs) does it very poorly. Um, yeah. And so you have the, the contrast of like, that and she's topless throughout the scene, so that's kind of you know that comes at you as well. Um, adulty, very, very adulty, and it just um, it feels creepy in the moment, which I think is intentional. But then the fact that it's never addressed right. afterwards also feels shocking. Um, and so I just, I just you know it's one of those things where I'm like, I still feel like there was a better way of handling this. Yeah. I, uh, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, oh, definitely. So for me, the, the whole scene actually started uh, when they run back from the rain. Mm-hmm. She comes in, she takes off her boots. She's having a problem with one boot. It comes out, the change, the money comes out. Mm-hmm. And he looks at her and he looks at her legs. He looks at her mm-hmm. ankles. And yep. that's when the moment starts. Mm-hmm. 
So he's not sure what to do here. He's it's what he wants. The frustration. We all know the frustrations there. We mm-hmm. all know that that you know this is what he wants. Yep. But she's not really willing to do that. Mm-hmm. That's not what she wants. She wants mm-hmm. something else. And so there's this conflict, obviously, of interest. And and then the whole scene pans out. And it's it and you know like we agree there wasn't malice. It wasn't that he was. I'm going to rape you. You know, mm-hmm. be creepy yeah. rape yeah. this guy. He's just like, I like you, I want you, you, I think you should feel the same way about me, so we're just going to go and see what happens. And as we all agree again, it goes terribly, horribly wrong in so many levels. So as he's, you know, he, he comes, so, you know, the struggle happens, he, they're down on the floor, he's trying to hold her down. He stops because he realizes what he's doing and, you know, like, the, yeah. and he's doing it. He's like, ah, hell no, what am I doing? This mm-hmm. is just you see it in his face. You know he yeah. you know he feels bad. He knows he knows that he's wrong. Yeah. And then you know, right. So he gets canned and so he hits the floor. Now, did you notice in the background? Yeah. That the kid wakes up. The kid wakes up, yeah, sleepily looks around, sees what's happened, mm-hmm. and almost yeah. just goes almost as if again this is happening yeah. again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And goes back to sleep. Mm-hmm. The next morning comes up. Mana's walking out. She doesn't say anything. He wakes up. He chases after her. And that's, you know, this, the scene is bad enough, right? Yeah. yeah. Then, then he comes out and he's trying to apologize, which he needs to do. Mm-hmm. And he's going out there and she's just like, oh, it's not your fault. Yeah. It's my fault. Yeah. Because I had to be able yeah, to forgive was... myself. And you, the look on his yeah. face, <laughs> at least there was that look on his face of WTF. Mm-hmm. Like no, I, I'm the bad guy. Yeah. Me, I'm. He knows yeah. it. But and then, like you say, Brent. Once that happens, once she, it's almost as if okay, we're gonna just go walk away from this un- thing that we don't know really know how to to wrap up in a pretty little yeah. bow, and mm-hmm. we're just not gonna reference it again, and we're just gonna move forward. Mm-hmm. And you know, it could have just been really simple. He could have come around, saw her half naked, and she could have put a love Hina and gone. How dare you? Mm-hmm. Boom. Yeah. Everything's fine. Right. Because we get it. Punishment is served. He knows he's wrong. Mm-hmm. She's right. He was being a jerk. He apologizes. He deserves the smack. Then we can move on mm-hmm. because the, the things that need yeah. to be settled are settled. You have no settlement of this throughout the rest yeah. of the movie. Yeah. You know, you carry that with you the rest of the movie that he's done this. And there's really no rectifying it there, there's there's no solution any nothing and, and there are two yeah. important things about that i'm really glad you brought that up one is it should be pointed out there is a culture of saying it's not your fault or or of, of sort of forgiveness culture in japan if somebody says oh i apologize you go no no it's, it's okay right even if it is or even if it's not that, that's still just kind of what you're expected to say um, right. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do in this situation, whatever. But that, that is a common sort of just response to things. But two, I think, again, I think that is also kind of intentional. That colors their relationship for the rest of the film. And you can tell yes, he it does. feels, you know, he feels about it for the rest of the film. And again, I do appreciate that at least they wove that into it of saying this isn't just something that you, okay, well, it, oh, it's okay now. You know, that happened. Well, seeing this again, because mm-hmm. I had seen, I, you had recommended it mm-hmm. eons ago, so I watched it then and watched it again. And it's like, for this experience, yeah. where she apologizes, and it, mind you, this you everything is in its milieu. You have to look at the mm-hmm. time frame that this was made. So 1986. I got stuck thinking about a couple of years ago where there was a female voice actress or a mm-hmm. female actress in Japan, and she had to apologize to her harasser uh, yeah. to like Big preserve list. her career. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I just had that dissonant moment yeah. where it was like, you know, clonging me upside the head <laughs> with the trophy where I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. you're apologizing to him to sustain this relationship. Yeah. And he is entirely in the wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you should have more than just hit him with a trophy. You should have mm-hmm. clubbed him for a little while with the trophy. <laughs> And then never forgiven him. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, like this thing that happened in the 21st century, 
oh, I'm so sorry. Let's restore the relationship and make sure things are all going forward and doing as we need to do. It's like, yeah. oh, my goodness. No, please. Yeah. And, like, and I'm sure that's kind of the, the, you know, what they're going for here is that, you know, she's just trying to plaster over the, the relationship so we can continue, you know, yeah. because this is the only, you know, adult in her life, really, um, you know, that, 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 that really uh, you know, cares for her in this way. Um and, and yeah. she certainly alludes to Mana's parents, mm -hmm. which uh, that she's that Mana is from a broken home and that yeah. not her daughter. Yeah, um, right. But she certainly alludes that Mana has seen all kinds of terrible things. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I can appreciate. Yeah, she's trying to sort of normalize things mm -hmm. so Mana doesn't just stand there and wail. Yeah, because M Mana doesn't really talk. You know, mm -hmm. she only says a handful right. of things the whole entire film uh -huh. because obviously she's psychologically scarred. Mm -hmm. So I, I get where Rakini's coming from, trying to basically keep all the balls in the air while she's juggling, but it's just mm -hmm. like, I, you know, yeah, his little his little <laughs> move, <laughs> maneuver just mm -hmm. got me gritting my teeth, like, ah, oh, you know, you, know, you really wanted to say, you know, it's really okay. You want to give him a swift kick? Yeah, yeah, right, right. yeah, totally. uh, yeah. No, he and, and 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 he probably would say, thank you, I deserve <laughs> that because. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. clearly he's wrong. But well, that was one of the things where, you know, you brought up a, a good point, John, where, it, you know, the, taking the time period of where it's, where it's, where it's done, it's 1986 is when this was made. And, you know, definitely the, the, the you know, thoughts and, and ideas of 86 is a lot different than 2020. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, that's not a scene that would happen. That, that mm -hmm. would not be in there day that would not be that would not be a thing mm -hmm. and if it was a thing then the movie would take in a whole different direction because it yeah, had to it have been, been about handled far differently yeah. yeah and and because of that because that would have been the thing that changed the movie yeah no. so you know it's it's just so it but it's still jarring mm -hmm. to know you know so like part of me was like you know the the hashtag me too, me too movement i'm like right. going, wow yeah. you know, this, this is not gonna you know this would never mm -hmm. fly yeah. with that so this just would never happen but then again you again you know it's you know i you know grew up in the 80s and so you know i were familiar with those kinds of tropes and stuff mm -hmm. and you know I'm not saying that I went around and shoved girls onto the ground and you know, mm. did things but saying that you know clearly there is still an understanding of this is wrong mm. yeah and the fact that there was no real resolution of and, and and I think this is, the, the film is interesting from that perspective of of basically saying this happens a lot, and Mana's reaction indicates this happens a lot. You know, think about it, won't you? Basically, yeah. Um, I also want to take a pause and t and look at chat here real quick because Jay Biz brings up a really interesting point that um, uh, Shrotu actually um, has some of the hallmarks of having like PTSD. Um, going back to that initial apocalypse. Now seeing he kind of has that shell-shocked behavior in him um, to an extent mm. in the film. Um, and you can see his sort of mental development throughout the film of, of his sort of growing stronger and stronger. So I think one of the interesting ways that you, you can look at the film through is from that perspective of, of not mental illness, but of, um, of mental problems. You know, that you know, Mana obviously has issues Maybe Shrotsu yeah. has mental issues that he's working through that he's trying to, to, to figure out. Um, and that kind of plays into that scene too. And, you know, obviously, um, um, you know, uh, Rikini has her own, uh, her own mental hangups or her own mental, you know, perspectives on things too. Um, yeah. And that those are all sort of bouncing off each other in, in complex ways in the movie. Um, so, yeah, it's a tough scene because it does kind of come out of nowhere. Well, come out of nowhere, but it, 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 it is not a scene that the movie is hinting at is going to come, and then it comes, and yeah. it's over in, like, 15 seconds. Um, uh, and it's just very, very shocking. Um, <clears throat> and then we kind of accelerate into the ending, um, where they're actually going to move forward, and they're actually going to go to space. Um... And what I find so fascinating about this is that, you know, um, by this point in the film, you're like, okay, I know where this is going, right? Like, he's obviously going to get strapped to the rocket. He's obviously going to go up. You know, that's going right. to happen. Um, 
Uh, and then <laughs> there's an air raid. Um, and it's just, it's just so interesting because on the one hand, you know, again, you, it's being made for otaku. Like, what would make a cool ending? You know, rocket launch, a rocket launch is fine, but let's not stop there. <laughs> That's yeah. not exciting enough. <laughs> let's also have a battle going on at the same time. Um... Let's go vi violate neutral territory <laughs> by building this rocket complex in the middle of this, this border country. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds like a super brilliant, plan. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, whereupon you get, I would argue, one of the you know finest works of aircraft animation ever put on film. It's pretty damn awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So of the stuff that I've seen of this movie in the past, because this is mm. the first time I've actually seen it all the way through, I've seen like clips just like on YouTube, like two, three minute clips, whatever here and there. But usually what I see are AMVs and it's almost always the the, the raid scene and yep. the flying and just the different aircraft and how they mm -hmm. move about, explode and, and crash and you know how people are flying and, and um you know, there's no echo jumping around. <laughs> yeah. But um no, seriously. Yeah. But you know, the AMVs oh, the AMVs are always, you know, just kind of showing that. Mm -hmm. And it's just this great one of the big things I really liked about this is that this was a um World War One dogfight setup. Mm. In that they used World War Two plane technology in a World War One setup. Mm. If you watch how they come in and then how they go around each other mm. And start the dogfight. In the dogfight started to expand in in area mm. as the technology and speed of the plane of the mm. aircraft grew. Mm. In the anime, they kept it concise within over top of the mm. um, of the of the rocket, rocket. Of, the, of the neutral yeah. area, and that was really great because you saw when they pull back from the scenes onto the ground, and you have the great ground action, which reminded me of the first scene in Pat Labor. Mm two yeah um where or, but anyway they, they pull back and you see both planes and the great part about the planes is that they're so distinctive from each other so yeah even though they were little dots in the animation you knew who was who mm -hmm. and right. the way that they were fighting it was so compact it was really great and the the ground fighting i remember you guys saying something about how like the ground fighting was really the action was really cool and it really did remind me of i really think it's pat is it pat labor two where the blimp is involved i forget that one or so yeah that's i think that's two mm -hmm. and in the beginning of two it shows the main villain i'll take your word for it <laughs> it shows the main villain in actually what looks like one of those tanks that was actually mm -hmm. used in 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 in, in royal space force and it, just how the explosions and detritus moves around it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, the, you were saying cult earlier, mm -hmm. Brent. And I saw the, the enemy coming in and the way that they have this face mask. I'm like, mm -hmm. which cult is this invading <laughs> this country? What, 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 what are we trying to do here? <laughs> yeah. but, um, but it was just really interesting and how, and also how the, the area around the, 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 the liftoff area where the bunkers were were actual World War bunkers and trenches. That's mm -hmm. the trench system, yeah. World War One trench system that they set up there. And I was like thinking to myself, like going, as you're pointing out, Brent, you can't just launch a rocket out of nowhere. <laughs> you have to have all this going yep. on, or else it's going to be yeah. boring. Right? You have to have all. This <laughs> you know, mm. death and destruction going on around you. And meanwhile, the guys, you know, you have to have the scene of, oh, darn it, we're going to continue forward. <laughs> and, you know, and they, and they, but they're all in there and they're, it's just like, and just the level of tenseness I love, mm. which is, you know, with the, it, if just guys sitting in front of computers, steampunk almost like, yeah. Computers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things ticking and moving and just mm -hmm. like the wonderful detail of the gears and <laughs> all this stuff and mm -hmm. you know the little lights counting down you have no idea what that is yeah, saying, the, the numbering yeah. system was just this so, sort of mm -hmm. cyan colored yeah. thing clicking down like and, and so i'm just like going yeah you can't just have this thing lift off <laughs> mm -hmm. um but uh but you know so it, it was just it was just one what i'm trying to say is to lump it into to easier words it was beautiful 
It was just a, yeah. a beautiful. It, it's it's a battle scene that I had, an animated battle scene that was beautiful, and I haven't seen that in a very very long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, one thing I, I will note about our hero is that did you notice that they made a point of him combing back his hair? I did not notice what, that. So when he was getting ready for the to, to get put into the suit, suited up, you know, suited up, and everything, yeah. he looks at himself in the mirror for a very long time, mm. and he actually combs back his hair because his mm. hair is always this, yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, yeah. and he and he brushes mm. it back because he has to, you know, and he puts mm. his you know phones on so he keeps it out of his face, and to me that was like. The point at which he grew up, finally, mm-hmm. where the purpose sets right. in, and this yeah. is, I can't be this guy anymore. Yeah. So, he, so he comes right. back and he stops being that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, Meanwhile, yeah, the yeah. battle's raging all around. <laughs> and, and again, I think this is you know, so many of these things are otaku making a statement about because you know it's not just about um, you know rocket launch versus war. They had to design those tanks. They had to figure out yeah. where the battle lines were so that on the background they could draw that there to have the smoke coming out from there. You know, all these little bits and pieces were all thought through and they all sell. You know, you believe every detail yeah. of this. There's just a Well, I like the fact that for the detail of the rocket, yeah. as opposed to using like the Saturn V, mm-hmm. they use a Soyuz class. So, yeah, it's a class. Soviet, yeah. you know, multi rocket giant. Mm. Thunder stick, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> and it's just like that's a very stylistically that interesting choice for a rocket, mm. you know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, um, and it's just, and it's just fascinating because um, you see all of these all these things happening, um, and it provides this interesting thing because again, I, I think part of the interesting thing is again getting back to what you're saying about context. You know, by the late '80s, we have shuttle launches. You know, um, and we have that 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 thing where okay, space has become mundane. You know, launching to space right. becomes just a thing that we do. And so, making a movie where the climax is simply the liftoff of a rocket doesn't have the same punch as will these planes take it out before it gets up. And so, the the tension of those moments and the tension of seeing it launch and then seeing it launch. I mean, even to this moment is just. You know, watching it again, it just it brings yeah, tears to your brilliant. eyes. It's brilliant. Yeah. Now, for a a historical perspective, mm-hmm. true historical perspective, whenever a launch, a manned launch goes up, mm-hmm. um, I can't say this for other space agencies, but for NASA, the Air Force sends up a plane alongside it mm-hmm. to prevent any missiles mm-hmm. or a chase plane. plane. It's a, it's a chase plane yep. to to make sure that nobody interferes with mm-hmm. that. So, you know, as I'm watching this, I, I was just like going, I, you know, <laughs> which probably added more to it. I was just like, going, oh, yeah, I remember them telling us about yeah. flying F-16s. But then as the launch goes up, and the reason why the launch is so important is that when you see the reactions of the fighter pilots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, yes. just like, they're just like flying. They're just going. Holy crud. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody in the field too. They're in uh, so, Asian yeah. tank <laughs> battle. There's an infantry assault. Then everybody's yeah. like, "Uh, oh." I, I can just see the wow. one lieutenant there going, "Come on, guys, why are you stop? Why are you stop, <laughs> sir? Just look, look, look up, look up, look up." Which again, oh. <laughs> you know, there's that theme of the movie. Nobody cares until it actually works. Yeah. yeah. And now we've actually proved what's going on. I have a friend who hated the end of this movie. Um. Not this, but what happens next. Um, the fact that you have this whole um, thing they actually launch, and then he could not understand what was going on. Because um, you have this long, like, ten-minute, I think, montage sequence, like seven, eight-minute montage sequence of all this stuff. And it's the history of the planet. It's the history right. of their civilization yep. And it's all leading up to this point, which I think is such a fascinating, such a thoughtful way of bringing all these themes together of saying, you know, space is not just cool. It's not just something that we want to do because we think it's, it's interesting. It's not for all these other things. It's also because this is the next step, right? This is part of the whole journey 
all the way through. And it really just provides that context for, you know, what's been going on all this way through. Um, and even there, again, you think they had to think through all these costumes, all yeah. these locations, all of that. Um, and it creates this, this just fascinating sense of, of drama in the broader sense that this is, this has become opera, right? In, a, in an amazing way. Um, well, imagine the storyboarding for this must have been incredible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it must have been everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're going to need a warehouse, and we're going to need about <laughs> 65,000 square feet to storyboard all of this so we can piece this all out into the places it needs to be. <laughs> no kidding. Um, did you notice, too, that Rikini's, when he's reading the book, mm -hmm. and they're talking about, oh, you know, humankind lived happily along with the gods without fire until someone yeah. stole fire. And I'm like, Prometheus? Mm -hmm. Is this yeah. okay? Interesting. So we're incorporating a little Greek myth in there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like oh, that's, that that gives us a contemporary context. Mm -hmm. Definitely. One of the things I found interesting about that little bit of the movie was that you know, as he's reading the story and he's soaking it in, it, the story is basically about how you know humanity has damned itself, mm. and that's one of the things that he has to has to you know come across. And one of the things that you know he and his friends are. You know, always at odds with or you know they kind of know that it's all part of the military industrial complex they all know that it's part of that it, it, yeah. it, that it is yeah still get offended when people start saying oh yeah we're gonna put some type of weapon on this thing and it has to you know whatever to justify this cost or you know whatever yeah the great warship <laughs> <laughs> like i can just, i can just see it i got okay i'm opening up with a hatch i got my slingshot right yeah yeah you know. <laughs> Um, paint like guns on the side of it, right. like, not, not mount anything, but just literally paint a picture and take a photo and be like, hey, worship. <laughs> like, I uh, gotcha. But they get offended by it, but you know, it just makes him, you know, makes you wonder if this is what you believe that humanity is damned because mm -hmm. they take the technology and the technology is what, you know, is, is what's supposed, is what's causing all the problems, mm -hmm. according to this book. Yeah. Then he's rectifying what he's trying to do and at the same time understand why. She's, on one hand, excited but also disappointed when she realizes that this is all part of like a bigger mm. national plan, almost. Yeah. You know, just like, oh, I thought we were just going to go to the stars because we can and and bring peace back. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of like him going reading, going, yeah. oh no, we're all damned because we're going. Yep, and they just told me I'm going to put a weapon on this. Thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. And it's why it's such a wonderfully mature film. Um, yeah. Not in the sense of you know boobs and blood, but in the sense of it is dealing with really serious themes. Um, you know, Pandora's box, right? Um, yeah. like that, is, that is, to an extent, what they're, what they're opening up here, and nothing comes at a cost. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that it ends, you know, after everything with Rukini, basically on a street corner, going out to do her thing. It ends with a human, right? Um, right. Of just someone going out and doing what she believes is right, you know, day after day, um, you know, no matter, no matter the cost, really, in a, in a way. Uh, it's just kind of a beautiful way of ending the film. And, of course, the planet and the, the stars. Um, well, of course, I also love it in, in Shiro's when he does his monologue there at the end, mm. the fact that he kind of flips around looking for a channel. And then she starts broadcasting. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, true. That was awesome. wow. That, you know, the space program was pretty tightly scripted most yeah. of the time. Mm, yeah. So the idea that in this, you know, kind of funky military industrial world in which they live with, you know, the, the Royal Space Force program mm. privately basically funded by the monarchy – that you just flip the channel and be like, <laughs> we need peace in the world. Everyone needs to come. Like, really? <laughs> I would have thought Can they would have imagine? given you one channel, and that's <laughs> to their location, and then they will broadcast a afterwards mm. your speeches. Mm. <laughs> like, right. It's, it's, can you imagine like being that, that one ham radio operator? Just like, and if you're listening down there on Earth, wait, what? Well, I mean, what, what, where? What, what? Well, this is, I mean, <laughs> granted, you know, this is the thing that we went through during the space program on Earth where, you know, 
NASA was really worried about what those astronauts could say because they could have just sort of dropping F bombs in the middle of their broadcasts and the whole earth the whole yep. world would have heard it, you know, because um, you know, th- those were getting re resent out. Uh, can't control that too much. Um but yeah. Um before there were Zoom meetings there was <laughs> is this mic on? Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is one small step for oh son of a f- <laughs> <laughs> No <laughs> <let him off. laughs> Yeah. The FCC is going to revoke our license. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah exactly. The FCC is going to cancel the space program. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> they don't have any authority. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, and it, it's why the movie, I think, leaves so many people feeling s- such complex emotions. Uh, like, obviously, you end on kind of this, this, this big, expansive thought, but you've been through so much in this movie. Um, yeah. There's just there's really a lot there, which I think is one of the reasons it's so impressive is that it's it's kind of oddball, but it is it is so I don't think the word for it um, um, ambitious, you know, in how much it's trying to do for the audience. Right. Well, they got from what I read, like they really did get the right people on this program. Um, I mean, obviously the, the people from Daikon and yeah. the voice actors did even the american english um voice i mean i don't know if you mm-hmm. guys saw that list yeah um i th- think someone said brian cranston brian mm-hmm. cranston yep. was on there yep. um although someone said on according to it it said steve bloom was on there but i couldn't find his uh, voice steve Boulin, different voice actor Boulin. okay okay I, I misread that then but um but one of the other things was that the music was done by ryoichi sakamoto mm. and um he, for those of you who don't know who he is, he did a lot of the score for the Revenant, at the Leonardo, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio movie okay, that he won an Oscar for. Yeah, uh, okay. he did. He did the score for that. He did. He was partially. Uh, he was one of three people who did the score for that. He did score for. Oh, Last uh, Emperor. Last Emperor. That's it. Yeah, wow. he won. Was he nominated or did he win oh. the Academy Award for that? I'm not sure. But he was also mm-hmm. part of a um, a group in the early 80s, late 70s, called YMO, Yellow Mu- Music Orchestra, if I remember correctly. Mm. And, you know, and Ryuichi Sakamoto is a, an experimental musician, so he's the mm. one who forwarded a lot of um, uh, electronic music in Japan. Mm. So he's the one who's... Mm. He's, the, he's the guy who actually broke down keyboards, resynthesized things, re, re, actually re worked physically reworked things to make new sounds mm-hmm. uh, wow. in, in Japan. And he's done a lot. Smashed up the old Moog keyboard. And then yeah, think Moog. Think, it. think Next Generation Moog, and that's that's Sakamoto. Uh, and he's done a lot of jazz albums. He was he was probably... Interesting. Um, Yoko Kano, the, the, the equivalent of Yoko Kano in the early 80s. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Uh, wow. Yeah, for, for wow. Japanese animation, mm. for, for anime animation. Hmm. So he's, his, his name is everywhere. So when when uh, when I heard the music and I was like, oh, this, this sounds really familiar." Then the credits brought up his name. I was like, "Oh, well, that makes sense." Mm-hmm. And then re- watching the credits, I actually watched the credits like twice mm. to pick up on certain things, and I was just like amazed by what was behind. Because sometimes you get some of these wonderful things and you don't know who the hell these people are. Then you sometimes you watch these things and you realize, "My God, if they knew what kind of careers they're going to have later mm-hmm. on with this." Yeah. You know, I think this was like a touchdown for a lot of those people where it's just like going, yeah, I was going nowhere. And then I did this little thing called the Wings of Han Maze. And then, you know, then suddenly, for some reason, my career just. The director was 24 <laughs> when he made this movie. Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> um, went on to do. Um, wow. Um, Mahara Matic and Abinabashi and other stuff. Uh, he also wrote the, the, the screenplay for Gundam 0080. Which, for those of you who've seen it, you'll be Ooh. like, "Yep, that fits." Ooh. Yeah, wow. Um, which is considered one of the great Gundam, you know, works. Um, and for all that, they, it was it was a budget of eight hundred million yen for this movie. It was insanely expensive, um, especially by Japanese standards. Wow. Um, yeah, they just poured money into this. They, they were just absolutely um, certain about this. Um, Hayao Miyazaki praised it when it came out, um, and it made less than half its budget in box office. Right. 
Wow. It bombed. Uh, so for all that work. Who can train it is not. Wow. <laughs> you no. Know, um, yes, yeah, so you, you think of all this stuff, all this, all the work they put into it, um, all the effort, and it was unfortunately it was one of those classic sort of cult fan films where people who saw it loved it, but they were the only ones who saw it. Uh, well, given given the number of years, has it in the long run <laughs> at least gotten somewhere <laughs> with a ballpark of well of budget? And, and that's the thing; it, I, I have no idea. Um, but what's what's interesting is that um, um, this was kind of the springboard for Gainax's career, uh, where folks were like, "Oh, you did that thing? Yes, you know." Do more, <laughs> you know. You, you worked on that movie, yes. You you obviously know what you're doing. Um, so it's kind of one of those calling card movies. We're not gonna we're not gonna give you eight hundred million yet. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna work on something. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it was it was very um, um, it was a, it was a uh, it was a really big deal. Um, um, and it was really interesting. Um about how this is one of those things that just, I think, is... I have yet to see anybody who watched it and was like, eh, it was okay. You know, it provokes it, it provokes strong reactions out of people. Um, some folks don't like it right. much, but still kind of recognize what's in there. But I think, I think it's just, it's, it's remarkable. It really is a remarkable film. Um, anything else you want to bring up? was great. So, sorry, say again? Uh, I was just going to say, the, the assassin chase scene was, was yeah. great. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> I can find that. Um, so, so one of the um, this is this is me being being not so technical, but just kind of like detaily, is that when the assassin is is popping shots off at, mm. at our heroes, yeah, um, it seemed like the the firearm that he was holding was a, a gravity pellet firearm because mm. he kept bringing it back, and I didn't see yeah. him do any hand motions. Interesting. So th there is an actual rifle, air rifle, from back in the uh, 1700s that worked on this principle where huh. used gravity to bring it down and was an air shot uh, uh, good up to about 100 yards. Cool. And um, so I don't know if that was one of those things because, you know, as, as we've discussed, the technology and this is just a wide array of just mm -hmm. like patchwork stuff, yeah. steampunk almost, and just wonderful gear work. And then the assassin had this like almost toy gun thing, looking. <laughs> and and but he just kept having to go like this, and you hear the click, and then it was just a little pop. Yeah. And um, but like I was saying, the chase scene was really great. And one of the things that surprised me is that when they, you know, normally when you see a chase scene going through an alley, and then you see one of them squeeze into a tiny alley, mm. what you see is what you get out on the other end. Instead, you got a good, nice little three, four second segment. Of them smash between walls and like the side thing. It's like, wait, yeah. get away from me. You're the one who's attacking. She's attacking, not me. Get away. You know, and he's just moving this very claustrophobic face very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. space very quickly. And it was just, of course, you know, it was just who knew that a street cleaning vehicle would be a weapon of <laughs> yeah. death? Yeah. Well, I also found it very interesting that for all of the, you know, the bravado of the jet guys and the air, airplane guys, that Shiro is in large measure, but for that experience, he's not a very uh, forward pushing kind of right. character. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the assassin scene, it's got the humorous moment where, he's, you know, it's almost kind of like ping. Oh, huh? What? What's, what's yeah. that? <laughs> But in the end, for all the laying around, and eating yeah. buns, and fighting with sticks, mm -hmm. he actually draws his ceremonial dagger mm -hmm. and does the soldier thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. He gets yeah. onto that street cleaner and he does away with the assassin, mm -hmm. like a military guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like that's really interesting because you see a lot of his development in the rest mm -hmm. of the film, and then. You get that flash of um, unfilteredness yeah. with Rikini there in the mm -hmm. in yeah. the bedroom area in the in the yurt, yep. and then this you get that mm. testosterone-driven adrenaline gorilla response to to fight or flight, mm -hmm. and he is in yeah. flight until he can no longer do it, <laughs> and then it is fight. Mm -hmm. 
So that's some yeah. interesting yeah. elements where you have sort of a low hum, a spike of something, and then a low hum, then a spike of something, and a low hum. It's like, and that's it, just really it, interesting to do it that way. And I think that could also you know, speak back to those um, themes of possible PTSD, of being a soldier right. who's seen, seen some things um, and is trying to process it all. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder. Um, well, did they write anything about any of the inspiration? Of this <laughs> did the guy next kids sit down and write things down and be like, here's why we did what we did? I'm sure there is. I don't know find it in English, you know? Ah, yeah. <laughs> annoying. Um, um, there's a lot of stuff, by the way, um, on Wikipedia about this. Um, if you want to dig into a lot of the background of uh, some of the elements on that, um, particularly stuff around like the, the visuals and where they're try try trying to come from. Um, uh, there's a thing there about um, uh, do 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 do. Um, um, uh, just about like how they drew the characters and what they were going for in terms of you know visually and such. Um, uh, the fact that they were they were trying to make their um, they said that they they, they um, um, well Yamaga one of the uh, folks involved remarked what I see now is surprising the character Rakini is nothing but me. Uh, Sh Shiro is definitely not me. Um, if you ask me where I, where, I, where I position myself in the film, I identify myself as Rikini in many aspects in terms of the way I think. Um, I was probably somebody weird and religious ever since my childhood. Um, hmm. So folks talking about how much of themselves sort of came out in in the movies in which in, in ways that they did not expect, um, and the fact that like um, they were very thoughtful about whether the characters should react to the facial reactions should be anime-like, you know? Should they have outsized reactions? Should, should they be doing the standard mugging, things along those lines? Right. Um, so forth and so on. Um, um, but, uh, and, and by the way, Hayao Miyazaki himself, um, uh, one of his two criticisms of the film is that the rocket looks like a Soviet rocket. And said, uh, you know, you got everything else different. Yeah. You know, why why didn't the rocket look like a uh, unlike a Soyuz rocket? Um, so you know, fair enough. Um, but um, and then just other bits and pieces about like who worked on which uh, which parts and um, and how they right. they they made progress on all that stuff. Um, um, oh, and yeah. Um, uh, speaking of which, um, if you're interested in the folks behind this, there's a wonderful. Uh, live action comedy series called Blue Blazes. Um, or was it um, Aoi? I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, uh, it's called Blue Blazes. It's a, a, um, it's a comedy about the college class in which the founding members of Gainax all met each other. Uh, they all went to college together, basically. Wow. Okay. Um, and the uh, it is told from the perspective of a, of a guy who went to that class with them and is sort of narrating what it was like going, you know, being in an art class with Hideaki Anno and, you know, Yamaka and all of these guys and how, how they would just sort of, you know, just draw something and be like, oh, my, how did you do that? I just did it, you know, here, whatever. Um, and just how what the, those experiences were like. Uh, it's it's a it's a really interesting sort of slice of life, or uh, you know look at the anime industry. What it was sense. what it was like to be, to be in a class who yeah. blew, blew the entire curve out of the damn class. And, and what's cool is you get to see and it, like they actually reference a number of real world things that happened of like short films that they made stuff and those stuff and it builds up to Daikon three basically that's the the, the big climaxes and ah, making Daikon three uh, animation. It's not what, what I like about it. Um, is it's not, this is a bit of a tangent, um, they try to, to follow, like, history, like historical things that happened, and present the people um, in, in ways that are clearly characters, but also very much, you know, caricatures of what they're really like, you know? Um, so it, it's, it's not trying to be false to them, it's, sort of got, it's broad in their interpretation of those characters. Um. Um, and just showing how they kind of evolve throughout time, what they're trying to go for, and so forth and so on. So if you want to see, you know, 
Hideaki Anno analyze early Hayao Miyazaki animation in front of a television, like there, there you go. Um, <laughs> just kind of a, a neat, neat view of those things. Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Anyway, those are our thoughts on the Royal Space Force Wings of Honey Mise. Definitely an amazing film. And uh, yeah, and so, yeah, two thumbs up. And so uh, now we're going to move on to some other things. Going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with some news. We will see you all in just a few minutes.